She grew up as one of 12 grandchildren in North Carolina and often walks on her granddaddy Andrew's acre garden where she learned about pollinators and increasing yields. During the grows, growing season, you will find Heather in her mar, Monarch Way Station, Caterpillar Haven, video blogging her garden on her Facebook page, The Thoughtful Gardener. She encourages gardeners to provide wildlife habitat and fuel for native pollinators to improve vegetable yield by way of pollinator hedge row corridor, corridors. She combines information from her day job as a clinical researcher to guide her messaging and just completed an online fall gardening mini course, five weeks to a fabulous fall pollinator and wildlife fueling way station. She often sends milkweed seeds to gardeners throughout North America to help create host plants for the endangered monarch butterfly. During this pandemic, gardening became the number one hobby and she sends over 30 packages of various seeds to gardeners who could not find supply since garden stores both locally and on the internet were sold out. Heather's garden was recently awarded the Garden of Distinction in 2020 by the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and her nature photographs and articles have been featured in magazines and other mediums. Her proposal, the resurgence of pollinator or hedge rows, using science to create a pollin pollinator oasis in your backyard, was accepted for the 2021 International Master Gardeners Conference. To follow her educational video logs, she can be found on her new educational gardening channel on YouTube, Garden Thoughtfully. Today, she's going to be sharing with us her two other passions, travel and photography. She has photographed hundreds of gardens in over 29 countries. Her topic today is traveling for, it, for garden inspiration, tips and tri tricks to maximize your dollars and time. Thank you for coming, Heather. Anita, thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see that okay? Yes? Yes. No. Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I am fortunate that um, I want to tell you a little bit about my background. You heard that I was one of 12 grandchildren on my dad's side. And um, so gardening comes in my genes, literally. Um, my grandfather and my father were both preachers and they both had gardens. And uh, I used to spend many summers in my grandfather Andrew's garden, as well as for one of my chores, which was to pull weeds in my dad's rose garden, which I didn't appreciate at the time, but I definitely do now. Um, but one of the things that I really appreciate that my parents did for me, we were definitely a middle class family, but they both, both my mom, who was a teacher, um, and my dad, who was a preacher and a small business owner, felt that it was important to invest in travel for us. And it's created this hobby that I absolutely love. And I combine my trips now many times around garden competitions, gardens that are open only certain times of the year so that I can see them and experience them and maybe bring back some of that inspiration to my own garden. So I wanted to uh, share with you some of the international gardens uh, that I have traveled to. I certainly miss them this year since I've not been able to leave the United States, but I really appreciate the opportunity to go back in time with you and take a look at some of these beautiful places I've visited and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about any of the things that we talk about here today. So one of the things that I wanna emphasize about traveling is that part of the fun is definitely getting there. And this is in, on the way from Paris. Um, I took a train trip. Um, if you're familiar with Monet's art, you may have seen a very famous painting of the uh, St. Lazare 
train station. And that's where you get on in Paris to go to Giverny, which is approximately an hour train ride to his home. Um, I think that Monet would very much understand the time of COVID in that in his own life, he was an accomplished artist and his benefactor, main benefactor actually went broke and he abandoned his family, uh, his wife and six children and Monet and his wife took that family in. They were not living in Giverny at the time um, approximately a year later, Monet's wife died and those six children and that woman helped take care of his two small children and eventually she would become his wife. So I think we can all understand in the time of pandemic that, you know, and in time of intense sadness that his garden likely as it was for me, was solace. I think Ann mentioned my husband is a fine healthcare worker. And there were days during pandemic that the only thing I could do was go out in my garden. I was so worried for him and for my family. Um, and, you know, the garden really became a refuge for me. And I have to believe that Monet's garden became a refuge for him. He's famous for saying, I must have flowers always, always, and always. And I can't imagine a day without flowers in my own home. Uh, the picture you see on the left is the view of his gardens from the house. This is standing in the up upstairs balcony of one of the rooms. And you can't actually see the picture on the right without crossing the street. So they've created a tunnel under the road and he bought this adjacent property um, for to create the water garden here that you see that's so familiar from the water lily paintings that he did. But I think what you'll appreciate as a gardener are these vistas that everywhere you look, there are plants. So he was definitely a collector. He loved texture and pattern and he loved color. And sadly, uh, when his son died years later, this garden fell into disrepair and many gardeners came together. In fact, Americans were the first to uh, raise over $1 million to preserve this garden. And a gardener named Elizabeth Murray uh, wrote this book called Monet's Passion, which I highly recommend, that she herself went and lived on this property for 10 months and helped restore this garden to its former beauty. If you can imagine over the years, those lily ponds had actually filled in, so they had to be dug back out and restored. But Monet, like me, was also a photographer. So there were hundreds of photographs and letters and correspondence. So they were able to restore the gardens the way that they actually were. And you can see here, life imitating art. This is the beautiful, beautiful irises and roses. And you can see both in the photograph that I've taken, as well as the painting, the layers of flowers that he creates for his vistas, as well as the color palette. You can see a consistent color palette and the repetition of color in these different aisles of flowers. So, you know, I, I wanted to show you what does the painting look like and what does the real thing look like? Um, definitely as the colors and the time of day changes, you get to see lots of different reflections, but I love that you can see the sky in this painting and the sky being reflected in the photograph because it really does look like that. And I hope that if you have reason to go to Paris, that you'll take the train journey out to Giverny. Uh, once you get there, it is about a two to three mile car or bus ride to the home. I took uh, the opportunity to do it by uh, bike. And it's really charming to go through the little city, which is all decorated with flowers. The little village is precious, but it gives you an idea of what it was like for him to live there. And he absolutely loved Giverny. 
So this is the places that I'm fortunate enough because of my husband's heritage to get to travel to uh, several times a year. Typically, he goes and teaches physicians from around the world and yeah, is definitely one of his stops since our family lives there. Uh, this is a famous garden in the capital of New Delhi. And it's actually the garden that accompanies the home of the, pre of the president. So it is only open open, however, two weeks of the year. So I felt really fortunate to be able to see this. Um, they do not allow any gear whatsoever inside. So this is not a professional camera picture. It's just a, a quick cell phone snap, but um, it's definitely worth seeing. But why timing becomes so important with gardens is obviously when they're at peak bloom is when they want you to see them. And I have literally missed gardens by a day. There's a famous a tulip garden called Kuchenhof in Amsterdam. And because I wasn't paying attention to when I booked my flight, we missed it by a day because we landed the next day in Europe. <laughs> so you just wanna make sure that you're accounting for the, the time change as well. This is a dear friend of mine, uh, Lynn Hansen. Uh, she and her husband live just outside of London, but I met her at a cooking class in France and uh, we became friends, she and her husband and I, and uh, for years they were living in Switzerland. So I have traveled many times to see them and see the beautiful gardens of Switzerland, as well as France and England. Um, and one tip that I recommend both here in the United States and around the world is to join the horticultural society of that country. Uh, the Q, which is a very famous uh, Royal Horticultural Society in, in London, um, they offer a program that if you buy a membership, you can bring a friend to the garden for free. So she and I took it upon ourselves to try to see as many gardens as we possibly could last year when I visited her. And this is the beautiful Q Garden, which in and of itself is a day's walk. So uh, some of these gardens are really lovely and very large. And I've been blessed with beautiful weather every time I've been to London. Um, but you know, you just want to be prepared for foul weather as well as make sure you have good walking shoes because it is quite a hike. I also love to stay in gardens. Uh, we had the opportunity to attend a wedding of a former colleague of mine in South Africa. This is in Stellenbosch, South Africa. It's about an hour outside of Cape Town. And this is a protea farm. So we actually stayed on a flower farm in the wine country uh, to attend the wedding. And this is my friend's beautiful bouquet made with a protea flower, which is indigenous to that area. But I just think they're so unusual and so lovely. And I definitely think including your accommodations into your trip can make your time well, because you can then tour those gardens at your leisure. I have planted hundreds of alliums in my yard since uh, my trip to the UK. I completely fell in love with the lollipop shaped flowers and you can see from this display how many different varieties that there are. Um, I often think to myself when I see my pollinators visiting these flowers that I am curious as to how many bees can land on one before it'll flop over. I have seen just literally they attract uh, bees like flies to honey. Uh, so I highly recommend them for your garden too. But I also fell in love with primulas. Uh, they were in the gardens as well as the competition I attended. And these are candelabra primulas. I did bring home some seeds, but unfortunately I have not gotten them to do more than just germinate. Uh, we had such a hot spring uh, last spring that in a wet spring, they just didn't make it. So I'll try again, but I understand there's a Primula Society here in the US. So maybe I'll reach out to them for some tips and tricks on how to get them to grow, or maybe you know. This is a garden in um, Ischia, Spain, uh, excuse me, Italy. Ischia is one of the islands off the coast of Italy uh, in the south. And we rented a home here uh, for uh, my 40th birthday and girlfriends and I all stayed in this beautiful villa. And these gardens were walking distance to our home. And I fell in love with this bromeliad 
called Tillisandia. You can see it here on the right-hand side of the bottom lower corner of the picture. I just thought it was really interesting. So when I got home, uh, I headed out to one of our local garden centers and wouldn't you know, they had one, so I brought it home. But uh, to be honest, I'm not very good at tropicals. They're not my thing. Uh, I have killed more than I've kept alive. So um, I will admire them and uh, be happy to see them in your garden. I am not very good at keeping those alive. I absolutely love castles, uh, and this castle in the Cotswolds of England called Sudley Castle is really a beautiful gem in and of itself. It is an actual occupied castle. Uh, the royalty that live here, this garden was given to them in honor of their wedding. And while I was on this property, they were doing a, an archaeological dig which is really fascinating. Uh, the story was that Elizabeth I came here for an elaborate dinner party. Uh, the occupants of that castle at the time, this was in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, they uh, spent their entire fortune to, uh, to entertain Elizabeth for a few days and actually were almost destitute over this grand party. And while we were there, they actually dug up a piece of pottery that confirms that that was actually where the party took place. So in the backyard of this castle was quite the party. And my understanding is it in the entire time and she was not happy. And it, the gentleman who threw it did not get what he wanted, which was favor with the court. So maybe entertaining kings and queens isn't all it's cracked up to be. One thing that I saw in the gardens uh, were natural uses of supports. So here you will see they have used tree branches to prop up these plants and they've tied them together. But if you look really closely, there are very tiny tree branches within this display garden to prop up the plants and keep them stand tall. I have used this technique in my garden. It works fantastically, but what I wanted to point out is you can barely see those small tree branches. So unlike additional support, this actually blends in very nicely and looks really natural. And a lot of times people completely look past it when they're in my garden. They don't realize that some of these heavy headed flowers are being supported by tree branches. I use my river birch branches for this purpose. One thing that they were um, raising awareness of when I was in UK that I think is a really interesting way to potentially incorporate some art into your garden as well as maybe bring some awareness of the plight of our native bees is to paint stones with the bee on them. So what they would do is they place these stones throughout the garden underneath plants that that particular bee likes to frequent. And so it was a lot of fun to actually look out for these bees because they look totally different than our honeybees and our native bees. So they're really fun to kind of watch. But I thought it would be a fun craft for uh, your family or yourself if you're an artist. Some of the most beautiful gardens, especially in Japan, are found in the temples. And this is Arishima uh, Temple in Kyoto. Uh, it's approximately two hours bullet train from uh, where I was staying in Kobe. Uh, while my husband was attending a conference, I have taken this bullet train many times to Kobe because it is truly a garden city and it's well worth to add to your list of gardens um, because you can see so many in such a small area. Um, you can see here it's fall and I can assure you that if you think one Japanese maple is spectacular, hundreds of Japanese maples are downright gorgeous. So many people wanna go into Japan in the spring to see all the cherry blossoms. I would say that fall is a lovely time to visit Japan. And I've been fortunate to travel there many times, but I like to get to the gardens early. Um, this is the bamboo forest behind this temple. And it is a very populous, popular tourist stand, standpoint, especially to photograph all the beautiful bamboo shoots. But you can see the picture before everyone gets there, which I took first thing in the morning. And then as I came back down in the afternoon from another garden, how busy it is. 
So if you want to pit photograph a garden, it's really great to get there early or stay very late uh, because that way you won't have so many of your new friends in your picture. <clears throat> When gardens get crowded, I always like to look for maybe a garden that isn't so popular and maybe take a small break. This garden <clears throat> is located just up the hill from the beautiful uh, Bayou garden that I just showed you. It's a private garden owned by a, an estate of a gentleman who was a silent, a, a silent actor in, during the silent movie era and you can actually experience his beautiful garden which extends up on top of the mountain as well as you can experience having a little tea in his garden. So go from the contrast of hundreds of people to literally only a few dozen and it was really a lovely experience to be able to escape that crowd. As I um, connected with my husband and his colleagues after he and they were working, doing, doing procedures all day in Japan, um, I met them in this 200 year old restaurant with this lovely Japanese courtyard. And they said, how was your day? And I said, it was amazing. I said, the only thing that could make it better right now is if geishas were to walk through the door of this 200 year old restaurant and I had literally gotten that out of my mouth, not realizing that our hosts had hired geishas for the evening. So sometimes be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. And in this case, the young lady on the left is called a Mako. She is a geisha in training. She is a famous Mako because of her beauty. And um, they sang for us and danced for us and played games with us. And I really enjoyed this very memorable evening in Japan because they themselves are like flowers in a garden. Speaking of gardens, um, I think competitions are some of the most fun things to attend if you have the opportunity when you're traveling. In this particular case, uh, this is a chrysanthemum competition and there were bonsai masters shaping bonsais near him and Jay Castle about an hour outside of Kobe. And it was just fun, even though I don't speak a word of Japanese and they don't speak any English, just to watch them work and see how dedicated they are to their art. Uh, so really an interesting and fun way to experience something that's very precious to them, which is their chrysanthemums. One of the physicians that we were visiting, a friend of ours, recommended that I see this garden. Uh, this is a former governor's house and his private garden. And what makes this picture very special is what looks like a small house in the back. That's actually a tea barge. So it, it is one of the only remaining tea barges in the world. It's approximately 400 years old. But if you could imagine floating on this barge and taking your tea, what a lovely, lovely way to experience the garden as well as share tea with your friends. As I was walking from the train station to that garden, I saw a, uh, a, a small shop with curtains and I could see people going in and out and I wondered what were behind the curtains. And so I just stuck my head around the corner and I saw this man pouring coffee out of these beautiful teacups. And what made this experience so interesting is each one of those teacups is an antique and the one he gave me was over 200 years old from Hungary. He picks the teacup to match your personality. And he made me this beautiful coffee. And it just was a lovely experience to see different locals walking in and they get their, their teacup for the morning. We're gonna head back to India. And this is one of my daughter's friends. Her name is Cherry. And she and her mother said, we wanna take you to the rock garden. Well, I don't know if you've ever been to Rock City. Uh, that's close to near where I grew up in North Carolina. But I've, my pictures of rock gardens didn't 
match up to anything like this amazing garden in Chandigarh, India. Chandigarh is one of the only planned cities in India. Um, in the 1960s, they raised the entire city to the ground and made Paris-like boulevards full of gardens. So it's truly a gorgeous city to see. It's about an hour flight north um, towards the Himalayas uh, from New Delhi. And there was a road construction worker who decided to save all of the debris from the city when it was raised. And what is interesting is he then for 40 years made sculptures and created a garden in the woods. It was eventually found and the government wasn't too happy that he had done this, but the locals knew what he had been up to and they came to his defense and it is one of the tourist attractions today. It is a massive garden and I could do a presentation just on these pictures of the incredible works of art that this man has created with a team of volunteers. But they have used broken bangles and debris from tiles to create a really interesting masterpiece and unlike any rock garden I will say you have ever or ever will see. One of the things I like to do when I travel is to ask and one of the things I think you definitely can ask is can I participate? So in this particular case uh, they create these stunningly beautiful floating flower arrangements every morning in Thailand. This is at a gorgeous hotel in Chiang Mai. And I asked the staff about it and I asked if I could get up early and help the florist with creating the next day's creations. And I was allowed to help. And these were some of the ones that we made. Um, so it was just a really interesting experience. Again, no language required. Uh, she showed me what to do and I would just follow along, but we got to make these beautiful flower arrangements. Uh, this is doing the same thing at a conference that we attended in Bangkok. Uh, this is kind of an end of the year, you know, beginning of the new year celebration called Loi Krathong, and you create a floating, literally translates to floating banana. Uh, you create a floating flower creation and you light the incense and the, the uh, candles and you make a wish. So you're kind of burning the, the last year and welcoming in the new year. And I think uh, after this year, there might be a few of us that would be willing to burn this year down and start over. So maybe we need to uh, do a Loi Krathong uh, celebration here. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I traveled for business is when you get tired, look around you, find the nicest hotel you can possibly find, walk through the door like you own the place, use their restroom, read their newspapers, order a coffee, gather yourself, and then be on your way. And so this is the gorgeous uh, Georges Sanx Hotel in Paris. Um, I worked in Paris often and a lot of times would have a long weekend or I would purposely schedule an additional week to be in Paris and do some traveling. And every week, a florist from the United States flies to this hotel and recreates a new experience. Uh, so I have met him um, while I was traveling there. This is a picture with my husband. Um, and we were entertaining some clients over coffee. You can schedule a formal tea at this hotel. I've never had the time to do that, although it looks quite lovely. Um, it is the most expensive cup of coffee I've ever had in a hotel, but I think the beauty of the flowers makes the price of admission worth the cup of coffee. So highly recommend if you're in a city and you get tired, find the loveliest hotel you can and walk through the doors and order yourself a coffee. This is near Shaipol Airport, and you may be unaware of this beautiful experience, but I highly recommend it. It happens every morning at around 7 a.m., but one-fifth of the world's flowers, approximately 20 million flowers a day, is sold at this auction. If you dream it, it goes through this auction. Every color, shape, 
and form of flour is sold within about 45 minutes. And then they are then shipped out to countries all over the world. But it's really an unbelievable experience to float above these flowers and see hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of flowers, 80 football fields long sold within minutes and sent all over the world, including the United States. Sometimes the city themselves are flowers and jewels of their own. So in this case, I would say Amsterdam would be at the top of my list to be able to see beautiful gardens that are super tiny typically, but many of the homeowners here decorate their doors and porches and it just is really welcome scene. So you, you experience it, uh, but it is just such a, you know, free and unbelievable thing to see. I highly recommend if you get the opportunity to go to Amsterdam, it's worth going. Another charming city that I've been to where the town itself is worth seeing is definitely Gear, Switzerland. Now you may be a fan of Gear cheese, it's from this region. It also has a chocolate factory named Calier. Uh, this is the castle in Gear, and you can see the formal gardens here which are stunning. They sit and overlook the entire city, but the whole thing is a garden and it is a very compact and easy to walk city, a little hilly, but worth seeing if you head, head to Switzerland, which is one of my favorite countries that I've traveled to. Another lovely garden that I highly recommend is the orchid garden in Singapore. Um, the entire thing is full of orchids. And what I have found as I have traveled is that people are very interested to know where you're from in Asia and won't hesitate to walk up and talk to you. And this group of girls was together and they came over and asked if they could have their picture made with me, which of course I obliged. Um, but you can see here the stunning gorgeous orchid, orchid formations that are just everywhere. And again, we could do a whole presentation on just this garden alone. If you're an orchid lover, this garden is for you. But the people are so friendly in Singapore. Although you will see that I have my hair pulled back in a ponytail and that is strategic because my hair becomes very frizzy in that hot, humid air. And so I will just warn you, if you head to Singapore, there are no good hair days. It is just really too hot and humid, but it's perfect if you're an orchid. Probably one of my most treasured memories is traveling last year to the Chelsea Garden Show. My parents were coming off a cruise and met me there, um, but the artistry of this show is unrivaled. And I learned about this show because of a movie. Um, there is a famous movie uh, with a gardener um, named Mary. Uh, and it's the story of a young girl who was a garden designer and she wrote an affirmation of, thank you for my gold medal at the Chelsea Garden Show. And because of that movie, I was inspired to go to Chelsea. And I, Chelsea is just unlike anything I could ever tell you in that the people that grow flowers for this show are experts at what they do. Uh, they only allow eight gardens. Um, it, it, over 2000 people do um, request to participate, but they only accept eight outdoor gardens. This is one of the lovely indoor gardens. It was my favorite of the show. It was sponsored by one of the garden centers in the UK. Um, if you're going to try to enter your garden, uh, the rules are that you must have a sponsor. It's about $350,000 to have a sponsor that's willing to pay for you to build a garden. So you will see companies like Google and Ikea um, and Facebook sponsor these gardens because it's so expensive. But then they submit a concept and if their concept is chosen, then they compete on their own for an award. And, and the top award is a gold medal. Uh, this was a gold medal winner. It was absolutely my favorite. And before I left for this competition, I requested uh, friends via Facebook, you know, I'm going to this show. Is there any recommendations you might have? So this is one of the uh, competitions that was going on, which was a flower crown competition and a cut flower competition. 
but this was really the highlight of my show. So my friend reached out to me and knew a grower in Barbados, and this was their entry into the competition. Uh, so you can see here, they recreated the Mermaid Tavern. The Mermaid Tavern was where the charter of Barbados was signed over 200 years ago. And my friends um, here that is, is introduced me to um, is one of the competitors of the Chelsea Garden Show for the, for the cut flower competition. He and his team have competed for 20 years and have won a gold medal every year they have comp competed. So it was really a treat to get to meet him in person. It was cool to be able to tour his display and talk about how they came up with the concept and what they have to do to ship these flowers to the UK and how quickly they have to build it and then they have to replenish it because the show goes on for approximately three weeks. So um, it's a lot of work. You can see the immense amount of time and dedication and they start planning their garden um, submission about eight months in advance. The town of Chelsea also gets into the spirit and the spirit of this competition for the town was called Under the Sea. So you'll see all of the window displays of these very high-end stores. They hired these designers to come in and this one on the left was designed to look like coral, um, but everything is fresh flowers. It's magnificent to see and it's totally free. So even if you can't get a ticket to Chelsea, um, you can attend the town and walk around. It's a little guided tour with your phone and see all the beautiful window displays like you see here. Thing I will say about touring gardens is if you get a chance to have tea in the garden, always, always have the tea. So um, the hotels and uh, the different places get into the spirit of competition here too. And it, they had this special tea just for the Chelsea Garden Show at the Brown Hotel. And so my friends arranged for us to attend. So I told you a little bit about Mary and her garden. This was uh, her gold medal garden from the movie um, Dare to be Wild. And um, I hope that it's inspired you perhaps to enter your own garden into a competition and to ask friends as well as to follow other gardeners on interest, uh, Pinterest and Instagram, uh, perhaps for oh, your own inspiration and maybe take some of your next garden journey back home with you. And thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be with you. And I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. So Benita, do you need to unmute them? No, I can't. Uh, Susanna will. Okay, sorry about that. You, you need to, you need to make me host again. Okay. I will do that. So Susanna, I don't know. Um... Go up to my name, Susanna Reppert. Yep. And go to more. Okay. Click on more. Okay, and then um, make me host. Thank you. No problem. Got it. You got it. Okay, now now we can unmute. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions for Heather or comments? <clears throat> My goodness, thank Hi, you. Hi, Sherry. <laughs> thank you. I thank saw you. your hand first. Thank you. That was inspiring. Wow. I was like, such a treat on a gray, foggy, ugly day. And oh, thank you. I can't wait to start planning travels again. Me too. And for all looking forward to that. Is this a presentation that would be available to review again somehow? I, I would be happy to do that. And I also think um, Susanna. Uh, recorded it for us, correct? Right. Yes. I right. Did. Yeah. yeah, but I'd be happy to share my slides if you if you'd like that. I'll send them to Suzanne and distribute them. Thank you so much. 
I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not sure who asked for because I was Linda, Linda Dalton. Okay, because I could send you a link to the recording. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, and you yes, I would. I want it also. Yeah, too. Me too. Oh. <laughs> send us a link. Okay. Heather, like a trip around the world. Yes. Really, really, really interesting. Thank you so much. You are welcome. I figured that would be more interesting since we are uh, quarantined, not only home, but you can't really leave the country. So I thought maybe it'd be interesting to be able to see some gardens that maybe you've not seen before. And maybe it'll be something to look forward to right in the future that maybe you could travel there. Wonderful. Thank you. Heather. My pleasure. I thought it was just yes, delightful. And Thank uh, you, Anne. it started off right because my husband and I also rode our bicycles to Duberme from the train station. And it's it, beautiful, isn't it? Oh my heavens, yes. And the inside of the house and all the blues. And it's it's such an inspirational home, um, not only from the garden standpoint, but the the colorful home and how they have incorporated the colors of the house into the garden to be kind of like a conversation. So you'll see a lot of the same pinks and greens and yellows, and uh, it, it's just lovely. And if you can ride a bike, it's flat, so I'm and it's pretty easy, right? To you yeah. literally walk across the train station, leave your driver's license. I think it was 15 euros and, you know, off you go. Uh, so, um, but the, the destination that, that, that's a really fun way to get there. Oh, all your Japanese and other gardens were just fantastic to see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Japan is amazing and they take gardening seriously like the UK does. So they are really serious about, and if you've been to Japan, they're very, very disciplined people. Um, when I was riding around the, on a bus in Kyoto, I met an American young man and he told me a story about how he left his camera one time in the basket of a bike and he came back hours later and it was still there. Wow. Now, would that happen in the U.S.? Probably <laughs> not. Yes, it will. <laughs> I hope. I hope that it would. Right. But mm. just the discipline and the the beauty of and how precise they are about their gardens. I mean, they really work at it, and that's true in the U.K. too. It's it seems to be like in their genes. You know, they really love it. They're super passionate about it. That's why when I was a kid, my grandmother and my mother would always say, oh, I really could use a Japanese gardener around here. <laughs> yeah, where do you get one of those? <laughs> I agree. I so agree. someone whose name is just iPad has raised their hand. Does that mean you have a question? I'm gonna say you don't have a question. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, Fern. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just checking. Sorry. Can I ask a question? You bet. This, uh, this is Jan. Um, when you um, look at the different countries to travel, do you mostly go in the spring, early summer, or how That's do you? That's a great. How do I decide when to go? Um, part of it is logistics. So usually we are traveling either for work and there's a medical conference I'm attending or my husband is headed there to train. He trains physicians all over the world. Um, so, so a lot of it is dictated on our schedules. However, um, keep in mind, depending on where you're going, it might be summer here, but it may not be there. So when I was in South Africa, even though we were there in December, that's spring for them. Um, so you just have to keep in mind traveling that depending on where you're going, 
it might be the opposite weather. Now, that actually could be a blessing if we're talking about January in Pennsylvania. To go somewhere nice and warm and tropical sounds pretty amazing. So, um, but you just have to keep in mind where the country is located. But I do time it for when things happen. So in Japan, for example, um, their fall is slightly later. Um, it's around October 15th when their Japanese maples start turning colors. And knowing that information can help you with timing your trip to be able to see kind of that peak color. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, when you're when you're trying to travel is is the garden open um, and if it is open is it the right time to go and some seas some gardens like Kuchenhof are just a very short period of time because of the tulips and when they bloom so you just you know, it depends on what you want to see so I've traveled at all different times of the year depending on what it was I wanted to photograph or what it was I was trying to see okay thank you you're welcome. Great question. And I like your kitty. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Um, and, and unless there's another specific question for Heather, I think we're going to move Is on to. You haven't been to yet that you really want to go to? What's on my list? Um, so we missed Kuchenhof this year. We were supposed to go um, in 2020, and unfortunately, we had to cancel our, our plan. So I'm very much looking forward to returning to Amsterdam and seeing that garden in particular. Um, and there is another uh, Royal Horticultural Society uh, garden competition in July. And so I'd like to time my trip to see that one. And it's at Hampton Court. Interesting. Good. Any other specific questions for Heather? Susanna, thank you so much. I appreciate you are it. so welcome. But we do have a business meeting that we get to next for this second part. So uh, Merry thank Christmas, you for everyone. Take care. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.